All right. Let's see if this is going to work. OK, so this is the last talk of the day, so I really appreciate you staying around. I'm going to keep this quite light and fun, hopefully, nothing too serious. Uh, I have called this talk Crossing the Chasm with Multi-Arc, but as I said, I want to keep it light. Um, and I also want to talk a little bit about some of my time inside CNCF and uh, some of the stories and some of the things that I, I remember from that, because I think it's a different viewpoint from the community side. Um, and so my background is, uh, if, you look, if you go to LinkedIn, this is what it will say. So I started out at Google as a C++ engineer. I moved into infrastructure, developer advocacy. Um, I started a meetup called Cloud Native London, which has about 7,000 members. And then 2018, I moved into CNCF. Um, that's the kind of like very glossy story. Um, the truth of the matter is, um, I think I decided to join Google when I was a teenager um, because I heard Google has free food and massages. Um, I genuinely did not really know what software engineering was at that point or why anyone would, would do it. Um, but I thought, hey, this sounds like a cool company. Sounds like they're doing lots of fun stuff. Um, so I really joined Google because I went, you know, studied computer science. Also, I could get the free food and massages at Google. Um, I spent five years working on Google Maps, various backend features, um, and I left 2015 just as containers was coming up. So when I was looking around for what to do, I was like, oh, I've done Borg inside Google. I know how this works. This is the same thing. So I kind of just moved into infrastructure because I happened to know what it was from five years at Google. Um, I moved into developer advocacy at the same time. Again, fairly early, like 2016 was quite early for developer advocacy. Um, I moved into that because I was like, hey, I want to be a, the sort of person who travels and like, gets up on stage and does keynotes. Um, and that's kind of what I did. Uh, I started Cloud Native London, the meetup, because I was looking for events to speak at, and there was a Cloud Native Paris and a Cloud Native Berlin, and there wasn't a Cloud Native London. So I was like, ah, whatever, I'll just like, start it, put it on Meetup, see if anyone shows up. Um, I picked a date that was about two months away. I had nothing, no speakers, no venue, no sponsors. Um, and then more than 100 people showed up on the first one. So I was like, OK, cool. Like, there must be some, some interest here. Um, and that's how I kind of moved into open source and community. And then CNCF 2018, um, I, had, uh, I had a job offer from AWS at the time. Uh, does anyone here work for AWS, by the way? OK, I didn't want to work for AWS. Uh, so um, I slacked uh, someone I knew at CNCF, uh, Chris Anjik, and I asked him, like, hey, I've got this offer from AWS, but is there anything interesting happening at CNCF that you, know, you think I could do? And he was like, yeah, we're two weeks away from hiring a director of ecosystem. You would be great. You should, you should join. So the whole point of me telling you that is that like, I kind of fell a lot into the open source infrastructure container world, a little bit just by coincidence and good timing, a lot of it. Um, and I want to sort of tell you sort of three particular times that I really remember from CNCF. Uh, first one's called After CNCF You Could Be. This was when I was interviewing with CNCF. Um, I was about to. Uh, I was waiting for a phone call from Dan Cohn. He was the executive director. Um, so getting a bit nervous, you know, butterflies in the stomach. And phone rang. I picked it up. I said, hi, I'm Cheryl. He said, hi, Cheryl. I'm Dan Cohn. And after CNCF, you could be executive director of your own foundation, or you could be a VC, or you could go work at one of our member companies. And I was like, I hadn't said anything. I was like, what do you mean after CNCF I could be? Like, this is a job interview. I'm supposed to be telling you why I'm supposed to be here, right? right? Like, did I, me did I mess up? Did I already get the job and I didn't notice? Uh, but I really realized over time, that's how Dan thought about people. He was always like, hey, how can I set you up? So the next thing that you do, you can have even bigger opportunities and do even greater things that you want to do. And I've kind of tried to keep that in mind as I worked with community and with open source. And try not to sort of say, you know, can you do things today? But 
what things could people do in the future that's even bigger than what they want to do? The second, second thing that I remember is when I was a little few months into CNCF and I was getting my bearings, trying to figure out what was the most important thing that I should be spending my time on. So I, I wrote this long list of, of things that I could do and I took them to Dan and I said, hey, which of these do you think is the most important for me? And he listened to me talk and he said to me very, very calmly, you know, Cheryl, failure is an option. And what he meant by that was it doesn't really matter in a sense, like you can't predict in advance which of these are gonna work out or not. And failure is an option, so don't get too in your head about what is the perfect thing to do and trying to set everything up perfectly. Just try a few different things and see which ones work and which ones don't. And I was so grateful to him, especially in a new job where you're so anxious to try and do the right thing, that he said to me, failure is an option. Just don't stress too much. And a lot of the things that actually failed that I did at CNCF, no one remembers them now, thankfully. But quite a few things that I did just didn't work out, and that was okay. Of the things that I did that did work out well, um, people and timing mattered the most. And I think Dawn, sort of, some of the stuff Dawn said also reflects upon this. So my favorite story of this is, uh, is not something that's particularly well known. Um, but it's called the cloud native maturity model. Um, I had a, a consultant friend who said, hi Cheryl, like we've got this maturity model that we use at our consultancy. We help evaluate how far along the cloud native journey these different organizations are. Uh, we think CNCF community might be interested in it. Um, why don't you publish it? So I was like, okay, cool. But one company's opinion on this is not it's not really a community thing. So I filed it away and said, okay, we'll come back to it. A year later, a different friend at a different consultancy said, we've been working on a maturity model to help evaluate why organizations, like how far organizations are along to uh, adopting cloud native. So I thought, okay, like this sounds familiar. Let me do a little bit of searching. Turns out a third friend of mine had also published a, a different maturity model. So I was like, okay, this must be something interesting, let's form a group around it, let's go and publish it. Um, and this group ended up being called the Cartographers Group, and they're looking at different ways of mapping out the journey to cloud native. I wanted to point this out because there was probably, there was a year, as I said, between the first time someone said, hey, this is something interesting we've got, and oh, there's enough other people around it that we can do something together and make it happen. So I think the value of like being at these kind of events is really about talking to people and finding out what stuff is happening now, and then maybe it'll pan out in a few years, maybe not. But that's how the things that I've done that have worked out have always come about. So, right, what am I looking at now? So I work at Arm now, um, the chip design company, let's say. Um, and I wanna sort of, like Arm is, Arm is founded in 1985. So here's some other things that happened in 1985. Um, they found the Titanic, the wreck of the Titanic. George Michael's Careless Whisper was the number one song in that year. Uh, Nintendo published Super Mario Brothers, Windows 1.0 came out, um, and Back to the Future was the top grossing movie in that year. Now, in 2023, we live in a slightly different world. So. Connectivity and data-wise, we've got tons more data that we need to store and manage. Uh, we have 5G coming. Well, no, it's already here, but um, 5G continues to increase. IoT continues to increase. And then in terms of the trends, everyone knows the markets are a little bit tricky time right now. Companies are looking for cost savings. Uh, Moore's Law is coming to an end, so we can no longer double our performance easily, as easily as in the past. And then lots of companies also have corporate mandates, um, and we should do the right thing to save money and be more sustained, sorry, not save money, save you know, CO2, be more efficient with our use of energy and, and save the planet. So in the context of that, um, ARM has been really interesting because ARM has focused on a couple of things. One is that uh, it's a risk architecture. So ARM stands for Advanced Risk Machines, and that means that it's focused on power efficiency, which is particularly good for 
mobile devices and right now for data centers. Secondly, uh, it's multi-purpose, so you can create different cores specialized for different tasks, which means you generally get comparable or sometimes better performance compared to x86. Um, and then the third reason why, why ARM became really popular is because it, you can license, anyone can license ARM IP, which means you can get really customizable with different things that you can do. So uh, on the left, that's the BBC Micro, um, the very first ARM V1 ARM machine. Um, we have the iPhone, Apple created the iPhone off ARM V6. That's the Raspberry Pi. A couple of years ago, uh, a AWS launched Graviton to provide ARM in the cloud, and then uh, Apple also now provide, you know, developer laptops that are based on M1 and M2 that are based on ARM. And then the other thing that makes ARM quite different is ARM is really focused on the ecosystem. ARM doesn't manufacture any kind of chips or do any manufacturing itself. So from ARM's point of view, the world looks like this. Uh, you have the silicon ecosystem, which is what ARM does. It has lots of engineers who focus on designing architectures and um, what's coming next. Uh, it's really small, so you can't see this, but remember this EDA at the bottom right-hand corner. It will come up again later. That's electronic design automation. It will come up again. Above that, you have the compute subsystem, so that's where you turn it into a CPU. That's where ARM partners with lots of companies that manufacture the actual CPUs. And then above that, that's where I play, the software ecosystem. That's all the other things around it, all the tools, all the libraries, all the middleware that you need to actually run ARM. So ARM is now in all the major clouds, apart from AWS, um, you know, Google Cloud, Microsoft Azure, the Chinese, the big ones, Baidu, Tencent, Alibaba, so on. And actually, ARM really is everywhere. This is a very incomplete list, um, but gives you a little bit of an idea of some of the open source stuff, open and closed source stuff that supports ARM. Um, ARM's also in CNCF, in LF networking, and a bunch of other um, open standards bodies. OK, so multi-arch. So the goal of multi-arch infrastructure is that workloads can run on the best hardware for their price performance needs without developers being concerned about the underlying architecture. Uh, that's what it boils down to. Usually it means moving from x86 to ARM, but the ultimate goal of multi-arch is just use whatever is, gives me the best price performance. Um, I pulled these, these headlines today, this morning, just to give you an idea of what this actually looks like in practice. So most of the companies that are trying, are trying to reduce costs effectively. Uh, so there's, and these are some of the different companies that have confirmed they do use Graviton, um, quoting anywhere from what, 25% up to 63% lower costs uh, from moving to Graviton. And of course, you have to dog food your own stuff. So remember I mentioned EDA. Um, that is part of the chip design process for ARM, very compute-intensive workloads, used to run on-prem x86, and ARM decided to move that to Graviton. Uh, and the results that they found was 60% better, 60 better performance, half the cost, and then saved a bunch of power as well. OK, this is my one slide where I'm going to mention Kubernetes, because I said this is the end of the day, so your brains are all very tired already. But I'll give you some hints and tips if you think this is something that you want to try. One is Kubernetes is not just Kubernetes. You have Prometheus and Falco and Cilium and Flux or Argo or whatever. You have many, many, many applications that you run within Kubernetes if you want to run a production-grade cluster. So when we talk about oh, moving ARM to Kubernetes on ARM, you actually have to look at many, many different applications. So your strategy for this could be you move the control plane nodes and leave the worker nodes where they are. You could move the worker nodes, leave the control plane as it is. You could try and do a mix of x86 and ARM worker nodes. Um, 
each of these has its own complications, saves a certain amount, adds a little bit of complexity in other ways. Um, when you're creating your clusters, that, if you're, if, that probably means you have to change how your clusters are created. Um, that also causes problems if you're running things in daemon sets, or not causes problems, but you have to have multi-arch images that run, because a, deep, a daemon set will run on every node, so you have to make sure you're selecting the correct image for that architecture. Uh, in order to select those, that means that you need, you might have different limits and the requests per architecture. Um, you need to control it using node affinity and taints and tolerations. Um, and you need to think about whether you're building, if, like, if you're now getting to the point where you're like, now I have to move my actual applications, then you know, are your builds reproducible? What do your pipelines look like? So none of this is simple. <laughs> like, having just told you, like, hey, you can save a bunch of money and save the planet, um, this is like a year plus process to actually move it. Um, that's why it's hard, but at the same time, that's kind of where the pressures are going now. Um, and it's perhaps not a, uh, it, I think it's still pretty, it's still kind of early now, but we're getting to this point where we're crossing the chasm with ARM, lots of companies are starting to do this migration um, because effectively all of this is a one-off cost and then hopefully you continue to save 20 to 40% on your ongoing cloud bills forevermore. Okay, so takeaways, takeaways. The main reason to move to ARM is just cost savings. You can get, in theory, get between 20 and 40% cheaper than running on x86. ARM is crossing the chasm. Um, 48 out of the top 50 EC2 customers use Graviton for some of their workloads. So it is real. Um, whether you're uh, uh, at an end user company that's trying to save money, or whether you're a product company where your customers are starting to ask for ARM, um, it is coming. It's coming and you should be aware about it. Um, and then thirdly, just again, people and timing. You know, a lot of the stuff that we, a lot of the reason that we're here in these conferences is to talk to the people and to find out what's coming up next. So I really encourage you to just get together, chat, have fun, find out what's happening in the community. And that is it for me. Thank you so much. These slides are on my blog at oshell.com. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cheryl. Uh, that was... Uh, Fantastically on time. <laughs> um, I'm like everyone wants to get up and go. Yeah, go off for dinner. I think, I think they're, so. I think they're good. well frozen, so they, they can't actually stand up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, does anyone have questions for Cheryl? Yes, we do have so a question over there. Two, I see two there. Yeah. Uh, maybe uh, just a minor comment. I'm really interested in adopting like ARM architecture and stuff, but uh, I see in Kubernetes space as a kind of major blocker is that um, many people use uh, those ugly charts made by Vietnami and they repack all the images at, uh, into like uh, x86 uh, architecture. So I think like vendors like ARM really should work with like those roadblocks to have a wider adoption. Because in the end, if someone like looks at the chart, tries to deploy it, it doesn't work, and then all right, like what the heck? Why would I spend any time on that? Uh, so, so I see like uh, mm -hmm. like uh, huge vendors. They have uh, kind of capacity, workforce, uh, many connections, so they can like kind of convince uh, uh, organizations like Vietnami to uh, to do that major shift. Mm. So you said they have ugly charts? Yeah. You mean Helm charts? Uh, Helm right? charts, okay. yeah. Got it, it, yeah. It's like a huge repository of, of different charts and uh, yeah. they always repack uh, like uh, binaries into their own images based on Debian and uh, mm -hmm. it's never compatible with ARM. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, well, luckily my job, well, my job title is the Senior Director of Ecosystem, so it's actually my job to go out there and make it more beautiful, make these companies 
I, I mean, my goal really is to make the experience as smooth and easy as possible. So I really want to work with these companies. And if anyone's here, actually, and, you know, their company wants to work with Arm and wants some, wants to chat to me about it, like I really encourage that because. Yeah, I agree. I agree. A lot of it's really, really ugly right now, and uh, it could be a lot better. Hi. Hi. Um, what I liked the most was uh, choosing the best cost performance uh, mm. for your application. Do you see uh, WebAssembly as part of the multi-arc uh, story? Say the last bit again. Do you see? Sorry. Do you see WebAssembly as part of the multi-architecture story? WebAssembly. I don't know WebAssembly in a lot of detail, but I think, from what I've seen, it's taking off slowly. So I'm sort of mildly positive towards WebAssembly, but I'm not super familiar with it myself. Cool. Anyone else? Thank you very much. Um, Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you.